right uh well uh welcome back everybody uh to san francisco dharma collective uh, i'm mc owens and this is our uh, f uh last friday of the month visual presentation on something buddhist uh <laughs> this uh this month um doing this talk on buddhist iconography um this is sort of a revamp and a, re a redo of a talk i did at sfdc a number of months ago um so if, if you happen to have been there um you might recognize some of it but i've trimmed a lot of the fat and kind of made a nice cleaner um like a general introduction to this idea of buddhist iconography um and actually what we're going to be looking at tonight is more or less just the evolution of the image of the buddha um and so even though there's a lot to buddhist iconography um i'll point out throughout the night places where this talk could diverge into all kinds of other talks uh, but i'm gonna keep it on the straight and narrow um and so just sit back and relax and enjoy um I suppose one of the things that I just want to say before I get started on this talk is it's it's kind of a unique talk uh, and presentation in terms of uh, like art history and in terms of the way the usual way that iconography or Buddha's uh, this type of stuff is taught rather than just giving you this really you know, like this is this Buddha, this is this Buddha and like telling you the name and telling you why. I'm actually, um, you know, I'm a teacher and I like to teach. I like to design, um, you know, ways of learning and pedagogy in that sense. And so I've designed this as a way to sort of actually teach about iconography and not just sort of give you a list of ideas to memorize in that way. Um, so again, just sit back and relax and enjoy the show. Um, uh, we're off. Um, as usual, this is sort of a talk that's connected to my other series of visual presentations on Buddhism. So you're going to see um, a lot of other uh, like little crossover from some of the other talks I've given. And it's actually very intentional so that if you're familiar with those, ta those talks, you would know where they sort of tie in together. So the idea being that I'm going to use the same kind of general map that I usually use, the same general timeline time is still going to be use, uh, moving somehow linearly forward towards us in 2020, yet somehow backwards in, infinitely, but yet moving from this axis point. You know, it's a weird chronology we have, but I'm going to stick with it because it's what we're used to, right? Um, and uh, the abbreviated story, of course, here is that the, I, the ideas that we're going to be playing with tonight all begin in India around the fifth century BC or so. And so this is gonna be our first Buddha. This will be our, our, for the first part of our talk tonight, we're gonna to be talking about the so-called historic Buddha, often referred to as the sage of the Shakya people or the Shakya tribe or the Shakya clan. So a, a Muni means a sage or, you know, kind of a wise person of the Shakyas. And the Buddha, Shakyamuni, as he's called, the original historic Buddha was from a region of northeastern India called Magadha, modern day uh, Nalanda district of India. And if you were to go there searching for some sort of record, of a visual record, an archaeological record of Siddhartha, of the Buddha, <laughs> well, you would come to a region in Raj, Rajgir near the, what was the capital of Magadha. And you would find something like this, uh, a, a foundation of what was once a building, supposedly a tower in which the uh, king of Magadha, Ajatasattu, imprisoned his father. And Ajatasattu is a historical figure as much as a lot of other historical figures, you know, that we, we know about them from, you know, certain evidence. But my point is, is that if you wanted to know something about the Buddha historically, all you would have are some rocks and somebody telling you this was once where the Buddha was. That's, that's what you've got. So as we move forward in time, we don't have any records, visual or even written from this time period. But we do from other later evidence, no Buddhism spread out. 
spread into all these different types of uh, kind of schools or sects of Buddhism. And then Buddhism as a whole was sort of united under the rulership of the Mauryan Empire, King Ashoka or Emperor Ashoka. These are his dates. And what you're looking at here is a, an Ashokan pillar. So Ashoka, uh, this, uh, again, a, a ruler, an emperor of India that sort of united the peninsula, the subcontinent there. And archaeologically, historically, we're sort of starting to get on firm ground here with these pillars. And so at the base of these pillars is a script, I believe it's called Brahmini. And if you read about Ashoka and his conquests and his empire, in the literature of these Ashokan pillars in the, in the inscription, it talks about the Buddha, it talks about the Dharma, it talks about the Sangha, to which Ashoka gave sort of spiritual credit. And so this was sort of considered some of the earliest historical records of Buddhism. No image, just some writings. But if we look ahead, a little bit ahead, these start to become some of our first Buddhist images in India. And you will notice, actually, I'll go back to our pillar. You'll notice the lion on top of that pillar, right? So this is a giant pillar with a lion on top. And so this is a carver or a relief, but of that same pillar, right? This has three lines on top, but it's the same idea. And that wheel on top, well, it's a traditionally a thousand spoked wheel. There's an, another version down here, which is a tree with a thousand spoked wheel at its base. This is another thousand spoked wheel being sort of worshiped or honored. And then finally, we have this interesting one of a wheel uh, and actually a throne or a chair, but with nobody in it. So these are all some of the earliest images that we have of Buddhism. And what we have as a common thread through some of these is either the reverence or respect for the wheel image and the tree, okay? Now, the, the wheel has a lot of uh, relationship to Ashoka and to the Chakra Varden, this kind of spiritual ruler. So it's not entirely clear this is a Dharma wheel or if it's an Ashokan wheel of conquest. But the tree is sort of definitely this tree of enlightenment. And I'm going to show you here, we're going to spend a little bit of time. This is something that's considered like one of the earliest representations of Buddhism. Now, it's not a representation of the Buddha. It's actually, in technical speak, they would call it an an iconic image of the Buddha. <laughs> Meaning there's, there's no icon there. It's an iconic. And this is an interesting moment in the history of Buddhism where in the early days, they didn't represent the Buddha. They sort of represented what Buddhism and what enlightenment and what the path of Buddhism was all about. And so interesting way to do this is that using this image, I wanna show you five motifs, five ideas that are represented in five hand gestures actually. Uh, this is called Amara's assault on the empty throne. Mara is this devilish, in many respects, the devil of the world that the Buddha defeated. And I'm going to quickly walk you through the narrative of that defeat of Mara, the devil of the world, according to Buddhism. So uh, just to let you know, this is from um, an Indian kind of relief uh, from second century common era. So pretty, pretty early in that regard, I'm gonna blow it up here. And so the first thing I want you to notice is again, the empty throne or the empty chair. This is a very early image of Buddhism, which is, I mean, it's kind of profound and I could be here all night just you know, musing on the idea of the, the significance of re revering an empty throne. So no, no king, no ruler, but the throne itself in that way. Well, what's being represented there is this seated practice of meditation, right? That would be represented by this dhyana mudra with the palms in the lap, that seated meditation, right? And it is through the practice of seated meditation that the Buddha came to enlightenment, came to defeat Mara. 
and in that sense came to a state of fearlessness. So if you notice on the upper left there, there's some a, like a, a dude with a sword about to, he's that person with the sword and there's a person next to him, they're coming after the, the Buddha seated under this tree of enlightenment, which is behind the throne. Noam, you have a question? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, so this idea of being attacked by Mara, the idea is that Mara was like, yo, what are you doing trying to escape my realm? And so by sending these attacks, the Buddha is said to have presented the mudra or the gesture of fearlessness. And that dispelled the attack, the attack of all these demons and arrows and all of that. Then Mara, the devil, tried to attack the Buddha again with sensual pleasure. And this is down in the lower right. You see a woman's hip. The top of her body is a little scratched away, but you see sort of a seductive hip. And that's actually Mara supposedly sending some sort of like belly dancer type folks to try and entice the Buddha out of his seat of meditation. And that to which the Buddha offered the gesture of giving, the Varada Mudra. Right, and this is this gesture kind of usually on the knee, which I can't really display for you here. And then finally, upon realizing enlightenment and defeating Mara completely, attaining fearlessness, attaining you know, desirelessness, the Buddha made a final gesture of touching the earth, the Bhumi Sparsha Mudra. And this mudra of touching the earth is this victory over Mara. Okay. And that victory and that knowledge and everything that the Buddha realized is represented by this tree of enlightenment that looms over the whole situation. And so the fifth uh, gesture I want to just show you really quickly is this Dharma Chakra Mudra, gesture of teaching. When the Buddha is shown with his hands, both hands joined near his heart or near his chest, it's the, a gesture of teaching. So even before I showed you any images of the Buddha, I wanted you to know about these qualities that we're gonna be talking about tonight. Fearlessness, desirelessness, grounded assurance, teaching, and then you know meditation. So those are all the ideas of Buddhism. Those ideas that make Buddhism Buddhism spread down to Sri Lanka, little island in the south, spread up the Himalayas to Nepal, and then into what is today Pakistan. And these are the th kind of three general directions that Buddhism spread out from India, okay? And then eventually, even from what is today Pakistan, Buddhism spread into what is today Afghanistan. And from there, this hybrid of Indian Buddhisms with a bunch of different styles, schools, and sects, all entered what is called the Kush Valley, okay? And at the time, first century through the, about the third century of the common era, or sorry, first century BC to about the third century of the common era, this was the Kushan Empire. And I have a superimposed map of the Kushan Empire there. You can see it's sort of, it's in, kind of centered in the heart of that Kush Valley. And it was a great empire that radiated out from there. So not actually out from the subcontinent of India, but out from the Kush, from the Kush Valley there. And just to give you a blow up of that, if you're familiar with your Buddhist history, you'll recognize a number of um, little kingdoms there, Gandhara, Kucha, Bactria. These are all sort of very familiar hotspots of Buddhism. For a moment, we're gonna be talking about this whole kind of uh, green region of the Kushan Empire there. This is one of the first great kings of the Kushan Empire, Kanishka I. This is a, a partial statue of Kanishka from, you know, his, um, basically from about the second century, common era. And I show you this just to give you an idea of like the type of sculpture and the type of artwork that we are dealing with here. The next image here though, this is actually Kanishka on a gold coin that he minted in his lifetime. He is noted for this kind of skirt, uh, this triangular skirt. You can see it here as well. It's down, down there. He's carrying a lamp and a staff. 
Now, what's interesting about this coin, of which we have uh, several of them, archaeologically, we've, we've found several of them, the most interesting thing about it is what's on the reverse side of it. This is, many historians and archaeologists believe this is the oldest, earliest known image or representation of the Buddha on a gold coin. <laughs> the, the irony, right? B Buddhists were not even supposed to touch gold or silver. So the irony that a king would put the Buddha on the reverse side of his gold coin is like just amazing. But I mentioned Emperor Ashoka. I mentioned uh, the even Ajatasattu. I mentioned these kings because of this close relationship between the spread of Buddhism and empire, uh, the spread of Buddhism and these kind of uh, rulers. So let's just take a closer look at this Buddha, this earliest Buddha image in Greek, actually, because that region of the Kushan Empire was heavily influenced by the Greek Empire. So they used the Greek script, Greek letters, and on the very coin itself, it says B-O-D-D-O, -D -D -O, Budo. <laughs> That's the kind of Greek way of saying Buddha. So we're, we're very clear who this is. And here I just want to show you this is the same image. Now, it might not be entirely clear what's going on there. Big ears, kind of a top knot. It's actually the hand, a hand gesture and clenching of the robe. This is a Gandharan, same region from where the coin was from. This is a statue, but of the same image. Unfortunately, the hands have been chipped away, but this is sort of very much the exact same gesture of the Buddha, exact same image of the Buddha. And this is sort of our introduction to this wonderful land of Gandhara, what is in today the Peshawar Valley, Pakistan, Afghanistan, a great kind of empire heavily influenced by Buddhism around first, sixth century. We're back to our Buddha here. These are the monastic robes, uh, these very flowy, but very Greek style, like a toga. Many art historians make a big point of this, that this region of the Kush Valley was so influenced by the Greco-Roman empire that they used a lot of the same iconography. This is another same Buddha, hands again, unfortunately chipped. Um, yet another one, hands chipped, but yet another one, hands chipped. But if we finally get one, this is kind of a full one. We have that gesture of fearlessness I told you about and clenching of the rope. So even before I, again, I'm saying like, you know, this is Shakyamuni or this is whatever Buddha, I just want you to start noticing these gestures that this is the gesture of, I come in peace. I mean, you no harm. That's the gesture, you know, in many cultures, Native American and otherwise, this is a gesture of peace, have no fear. So that one, I wanna, you know, that we're gonna see that a lot. And I just want you to, in, rather than associate it with a particular Buddha or a particular image, I actually want you to get used to this and thinking of fearlessness. The clenching of the robe is actually this sort of a pointing to and a gesture about this monastic garb, that these were renunciants, that these were basically beggars, that these were, these were like homeless beggars. That was the in initial life of the, of the Buddhist practitioner. And so that clenching of the robe is, a, is a, again, pointing to that. But this is what's really interesting, is that this is the standing pose, the samapada. We usually think of the Buddha as seated. And even, again, I kind of started this up by talking about the meditation. But in Gandhara, in Afghanistan and Pakistan, some of the earliest images of the Buddha, he is standing with the fearless mudra. So very interesting, this abhaya mudra, right? Standing Buddha there, another standing Buddha, fearlessness mudra, abhaya mudra, and then clenching the robe. But I don't want you to get the wrong idea. There are many seated Buddhas in Gandhara. This one, he's performing the, the mudra of fearlessness. And so Buddhism is, yes, a tradition of meditation. But I just want you now to get used to thinking of, oh, a standing Buddha. Oh, a seated Buddha. Oh, these are two very different kind of energies. One is a little more, right, dynamic, young, kind of, whoa, something's going on here. 
seated is passive, right? So just thinking about that, here's our seated Gandharan Buddha. We can probably infer that he was doing the gesture of mudra, mudra or the, the mudra of fearlessness, and then the clenching of the robe. This is the Padmasana, the lotus pose, that cross-legged position that we're usually used to seeing the Buddha in. He's seated on a lion throne. You can see the two little lions in the corner. Uh, we're going we're gonna to see that a lot, so I'll bring that up again later. This is kind of a close-up image. We get the hair top knot, long earlobes, halo, pretty classic imagery for a Buddha. And of the last image in this image, I would like you to just note the full coverage here. This is, again, the very Greek style robe. We're going to see something a little different when we go down south to Southeast Asia, but I just want you to notice this full coverage of both sh shoulders. In Gandhara, in that area of the oldest Buddhist uh, imagery, they do also have imagery of the life story of the Buddha. This is the Buddha, the baby, baby popping out the, the right side of the mother, Maya. This is a, if you've ever seen a skeleton Buddha, uh, this is the emaciated Siddhartha. This is actually an image. If you ever see a skeleton Buddha, it's actually an image of the, the young Prince Siddhartha as he was striving towards enlightenment. And so, of course, we're going to see the Dhyana Mudra, the Mudra of meditation, because that's what this emaciated image is representing. Extreme seated meditation for days and days and days. And this is actually part of a series of Buddha images and you can see underneath it at the base, it's sort of like other uh, parts of the story of the Buddha of which the top is representing a specific moment, right? So we'll see that again here. You see at the bottom, the seated Buddha surrounded by followers, but the actual image is the Padmasana lotus pose with the Dhyana Mudra in the lap. And now this is our seated Buddha, full lotus. You can see both uh, feet there on a lotus throne, or sorry, lion throne. And the gesture of giving. This is the first time we've kind of seen this in Gandhara, this right hand on the knee with the gesture of giving. And now actually the left hand has something in it. We're not sure what that is, but it is sort of being offered is the idea. So this is a Gandharan Buddha making the gesture of giving, the Virata Mudra. Also a Gandharan Buddha, but now the hand is the other way. So we see this is the Bhumi Sparsha, right? And so the images around the Buddha, those are the devilish figures. You can't do it, sucker, go home. And this sort of earth touching mudra. You know, I want to just speak on this earth touching mudra and what it means. You know, that this again, this is that moment of the Buddha defeating vanity, defeating Mara, defeating all of the world's, you know, defilements of the world. And this Bhumi Sparsha, this touching the earth, you can really think of it as sort of this deep connection with the earth, like the, the planet as a whole. So it's this immovable connection with everything, an unshakable, unmovable connection to the universe, right? It's a very heavy mudra. And so I just want to start separating it from these from these other powerful mudras, right? The Bhumi Sparsha touching the earth. Now we see Gandharan image of the Buddha, but with the hands at the chest. Now this may be the Dharma Chakra Mudra. I have my suspicions it may not be, but I do want you to notice that it is a dynamic gesture. The, even the face, even the gesture of the face speaks of communication, not the peaceful, serene image with the hands in the lap, and not even the peaceful, serene image of the gesture of fearlessness, but this more, a slightly more intense image of delivering the teachings. Something is being taught in this gesture. And we're going to come back to this gesture. And a sort of a final motif uh, that we can look to Gandhara for is this classic image of the sleeping Buddha. But it's not the sleeping Buddha. It's actually the dying or passing away Buddha on the right side, 
right? You see the, the followers at the top crying. Oh, you know, now, oh no, no. I want to point out at the base of the, where the Buddha is sleeping, there is a, a, a monk, maybe a nun, actually, with a little three-post thing. Uh, like a, uh, not really sure what that is, right? Is it a fire? Is it, a, is it his belongings? Is it her belongings on a three-post uh, uh, support? But just notice this. This is sort of a, another Gandharan image of the Buddha, everybody crying. But look again, there's our monk again with the back turned. Now the Buddha's in shroud. This is a very different uh, artist, but very similar motifs this sort of uh the person on the lower left there being helped with the hand by that person right they're like notice there it is again that person on their knees the monk or nun with their back to us with the the little trident post with the something in it so it's interesting to see these motifs because i i point them out only because it's not the last time we're going to see them even though this is we're in the middle of, 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 of Afghanistan. All right. Okay. So just really quickly, I want to show you a slightly different early old form of Buddhist iconography, also from Afghanistan, also from the early centuries of this common era, as we call it. This region of Hadda was even more influenced by the Greeks. And you can see it here right away in this kind of pillar, this very kind of classic Greco style of even architecture. And again, with the togas, here we have a bunch of mudras, uh, most of them dhyana mudras in the lap. You can tell a slightly different aesthetic, a slightly different artist, right? Similar, but different, softer, a little more feminine, I would say. Uh, this would have been the Dharma chakra, the mudra of teaching at the chest. These are followers of the Buddha, right? They're sort of like, whoa, what's he saying? He's teaching the Buddha. He's teaching the Dharma. This is a uh, Buddha clenching the robe in two ways. Uh, unfortunately, we don't know what this scenario was. There was some sort of relief from which all of these smaller heads were surrounding the Buddha. And I just wanted to point out a few really interesting ones. This is sort of a seemingly a motif of rebirth, this sort of being re reborn or something. Very interesting. That's a familiar image here in Hadda, Afghanistan, in a Buddhist temple from the first few centuries of the common era. Interesting looking fellow there. And also a very interesting looking female figure with the, with the head covered. This is looking very Mary Magdalene with our almost Jesus looking figure on the other side, but these are actually all images surrounding a, a Buddha. This is another one famously called the Celtic Buddha. It actually would not have been a Buddha, Bodhisattva perhaps, but interesting, like very clearly, you know, kind of European, Northern European features, but the long stretched earlobes, indicative of a Bodhisattva or Buddha. These are all from this region of Hadda fascinating look at this you would think that was a, a christian you know niche right there if you didn't see the buddha clenching the robes there but with the angels at the top so these are all from this region of hadda the third and last stop in afghanistan ba the bamian valley this is the bamian valley i guess in the early 20th first century like around the 2000s these are ancient uh, archaeological spots of giant Buddhas, of which they have uh, uncovered all three of them. This is one of the mo more famous one. This is a huge mountain, you know, carved Buddha. You can see, and I want to start pointing out the little cave cells throughout. This would have been a Buddhist dwelling. A lot of the statues and the types of things that we were looking at, the Buddha statues, would, were found in cave Buddhist dwellings like this. This is the giant Buddha of Bamiyan. Unfortunately, that was destroyed, blown up by the Taliban in 2001. This is what it looks like today um, with just the empty relief there. So that's all the sort of 
that hot spot in the Kush Valley, that's all the earliest, oldest known images of the Buddha are from Afghanistan. And some of it is like borderline Christian, definitely borderline Hellenistic with the togas and all of that. That's some of the oldest, if not the oldest Buddhist imagery. But I want to quickly go back to India, to the kind of the birthplace of Buddhism, to a very famous archaeological site called the Ajanta Caves. Okay. These are so the thing, the reason why I didn't start with these caves is that these are arguably older than everything I've shown you. But the, the Afghani sites that I showed you just now, they ceased being Buddhist sites probably in like the fifth, maybe sixth century. Whereas these Ajanta caves, they actually kept going. They were hot during up to the seventh century, but even up until the 10th century, they were still, uh, places of Buddhist worship. So the iconography and the images in there are actually a little later than the ones I showed you, even though the archaeological site is much earlier than the, the ones in Afghanistan. Notice a common theme here, this kind of in the mountainside carved into it. These are the Ajanta Caves. These are inside the Ajanta Caves. There we see an image of the Buddha. If you have good eyes, you can see he's doing the uh, Dharma Chakra, the gesture of teaching there. You get a lot of images of the Buddha in the Ajanta Caves. This is sort of an interesting thing, of course, about, well, the type of Buddhism that we're looking at. It's not just one image of the Buddha, it's many images of the Buddha. Those, of course, all have the seated posture, Padmasana with the hands in the Dhyana Mudra. Now we're back in India, but there's our sleeping Buddha, and you can see right below him that same monk or nun with the back to us and the sort of things supporting, holding maybe their, their, you know, their knapsack type thing. So again, I just want you to notice that there's these common motifs in these images that apparently, whether you're in Afghanistan, Afghanistan, or as we'll see, China or Japan, there are certain things that are a requirement for these images. This is also from the India, from the Ajanta Caves. Once again, are we looking at three Buddhas? Well, no, we're probably looking at just the one Buddha in the middle, doing the Dharma Chakra Mudra, the gesture of teaching, right? But these two standing images on the side, these standing figures, right? So now worlds collide. Because I was trying to get you used to either thinking of a seated Buddha or thinking of a standing image. Well, now we have both. And the one in the middle, the seated figure, is teaching. And the ones on the side are doing the varada, the gesture of giving. So again, this is where rather than telling you this is Buddha so-and-so and, -so, and this, these are bodhisattva so-and-so and so-and-so, I just want you to start noticing these gestures and where they pop up. Now, you could also might see that the, the standing figures have nothing in their hands. This one as well. And that's probably because they held either vases of flowers and they were flower bearers, or they held candles and they were torch bearers. That is most likely archaeologically what was going on there. And they are these sort of greeters, ambassadors, gesture of giving, right? There's two figures performing the mudra of giving, also probably would have had candles or flowers in their hands. And now we come to a mysterious figure. This is in the Ajanta Caves. This is the, uh, like a shrine, that's a stupa, and a new pose. Now the hand gesture, the mudra, we know all about that. That's the gesture of teaching. We're used to seeing figures on the side now, but what is this bhadrasana, the auspicious pose, where the both feet are on the ground? So this is something new. Also another one from the Ajanta Caves, both feet on the ground doing the gesture of teaching. I wanna hold off on who and what's up with that Buddha seated, but I want us to just notice that that's something new. Before, the Buddha was either full lotus or he was standing. 
So it's all of that, the type of Buddhism from India that we just looked at, and all of that Buddhism from Afghanistan, all of that is what goes into China in the first centuries of the common era. Eventually, within a couple of centuries, China has sort of made Buddhism its own. It's about this time also that Buddhism moves from Sri Lanka, but of a certain type of Sri Lankan Buddhism that makes its way to Southeast Asia. And so we're gonna take a quick trip to you know, Sri Lanka, Thailand, Laos, Cambodia, Myanmar. The Buddhism that's practiced in those countries all sort of share a very similar type of Buddhist aesthetic. This is a Thai Buddha. You can see doing the Bhumi Sparsha Mudra, touching the earth, but a very particular Thai flair, if you pardon the expression, is the flaming crown, the flaming head, right? So this is a kind of a unique aspect of Thai or Southeast Asian Buddhism. It's also a unique or kind of, uh, you can tell often a Southeast Asian Buddha, Shakyamuni, Siddhartha, Gautama Buddha, the, they often will clothe the statues, but in monastic garb covering just the one uh, one shoulder, having the one shoulder bare. They will also make Buddha images out of materials like jade, but also clothe it in cloth. Uh, and then again, also with this flaming crown, okay? So these are all sort of little aesthetic marks that are kind of, you know, specific to that region. But I want to just use Th Thailand and sort of the Thai Buddhist tradition to do a quick review. This is, uh, if I were, you know, if we were together, I'd ask you all what, uh, you know, this is the quiz, what mudra is that? And if you guess that it's the earth touching Bhumi Sparsha mudra, you were right. Next, we have uh, this uh, beautiful dark skinned Buddha with uh, the both uh, hands in the lap. You guessed it, the Dhyana mudra, the mudra of meditation. This, is one that's new and you don't see it a lot and we didn't see it too much in the Afghani and Indian Buddhism, but you do see it often in Thai and Southeast Asian Buddhism. And this is the Namaskara or the gesture of prayer, also just a, a general gesture of greeting, right? Um, and so a lot of times in the other Buddhisms, uh, the other like Afghani and Indian Buddhism, it's the angelic beings around the Buddha that are doing the Namaskara Mudra. But in Thailand and Southeast Asia, you often see the Buddha himself doing that gesture. And then a surprise Mudra. Now, if, if, you, you, have, if you didn't know any better, you might think that was the fearlessness Mudra, but it's not. You might notice that the, one of the fingers, the index finger is down, right? And that's the Vitaraka Mudra. Uh, so I'm easing us into these. So this is a slight, you know, variation, but this is the gesture of reasoning, right? The Vitaraka Mudra. And it's sort of like if you think of explaining something and laying something out, right? I've got a point to make. Just hold on a second while I make my point, right? That is sort of that gesture, the gesture of reasoning. And so that's sort of a new one. In all of those images, actually, that I just showed you, I wanted you to notice the bare right shoulder. So this is a particular mark of the Buddhist monk. The, it's a sign of poverty, a sign of humility, a sign of, of renunciation. And in Southeast Asia, the Buddha is, in Siddhartha, Shakyamuni, the Buddha, is very much the renunciant, right? And so it's very important in those cultures, Southeast Asian cultures, that the Buddha is represented as a monk, as a renunciant with that bare right shoulder. So it's also another little telltale sign, you know, not always, not 100%, but if you see a bare right shoulder, you know you're probably looking at a Shakyamuni kind of historical Buddha figure, all right? This is just to show you that bare right shoulder, but with the gesture of fearlessness to distinguish it from that Vitaraka gesture of reasoning. This is again, back to our Abhaya Mudra of fearlessness. 
and that begging bowl, again, that sign of renunciation. Okay. This is a common uh, image that you'll see in Southeast Asia and in, you know, in Thailand. This is the king of the Nagas, uh, the king of serpents, Muchalinda. Now notice the Buddha here is making the earth touching mudra. And you know, there's a lot of relationship between the earth touching mudra and this image of the, the Naga king protecting the Buddha. I'm not gonna go into to it too much, but I just want you to think about this idea of sort of this, again, this groundedness being so unshakably grounded that a giant seven-headed serpent could come up behind you and you would be utterly immovable, right? That's sort of the idea again, or the feeling of this gesture of touching the earth is that immovability, all right? And one kind of uh, uh, last new addition, a standing Buddha, but actually a walking Buddha. So here he has his foot up. He's actually doing the vitaraka, oops, sorry, doing the gesture of reasoning. And this is sometimes called the gesture uh, or this standing or walking Buddha with the vitaraka is the revealing the Abhidharma. This is sort of sometimes understood as a, a, a kind of a spreading the teachings, spreading the good news, spreading the Dharma. That's sort of what's embodied in this. You don't see this a lot outside of Thailand and Southeast Asia, but again, you can identify it from that flaming top knot. And of course, down in Southeast Asia, they also have the sleeping Buddha, uh, these giant, you know, room length Buddhas that are the, the Parinirvana, the passing away. But I also wanted to show you this image because of the intricate designs on the bottoms of the feet, which are also in a part of Thai Buddhism is the worshiping of the Buddha's feet and all of this detailed iconography just on the soles or the palms of the feet. Okay, um, let me just check the time, got plenty of time. Just a little bit more to go. Um, and I think I'll just go ahead. And so if you have any questions, ideas or comments, just hold on um, and, and I'll save those just for a period at the end. So I uh, backed us up just really quickly to that magical year that doesn't exist, zero. Just to again, this is uh, Buddhism moving forward into China around this time period. And I just want to bring us to a wonderful, magical little land in Central Asia. Uh, so this is kind of in between our Kushan Empire, in between Afghanistan and China. We come to uh, the Gobi Desert, to Dunhuang. And this is a region, this stretch of land between the Kushan Empire and China. That stretch in between in Central Asia was known as the Silk Road, right? Uh, very kind of famous trade route through which Buddhism spread kind of throughout uh, all of Asia uh, during this time period, big spans of time there. And this is, uh, you know, an oasis, a desert oasis, uh, way out in the middle of nowhere. This was where caravans would stop, was in this place that I'm going to show you, Dunhuang. Look familiar, right? Cave dwellings carved out, you know, all the all the temples, everything is inside these grottos. Um, they even made facades that would look like temples on the outside, but again, you're going into a cave, into an intricate series of caves, uh, you know, connected by tunnels. This is a famous library cave that was discovered in the 1920s uh, or early part of the 20th century. You can see the scrolls down there. This place, Dunhuang, is usually most famous because this was where Buddhism was translated from Sanskrit and other Indian languages into Chinese. Uh, it was a way station, on the, again, on the Silk Road. And so you had a lot of different cultures, a lot of different languages represented there. And it was a big hub of Buddhism being translated into different languages. You get a lot of amazing art representing this kind of wild culture that was going on in Dunhuang. And then this is sort of one of the most famous murals from Dunhuang that shows these two monks. The one on the right, very much a Han 
you know, Han stock or, you know, Chinese, uh, pale, hairless, almond eyed with his counterpart. This is, uh, you know, our Celtic Buddha, very hairy, big, round eyes. Um, so this is literally a representation of the meeting of Buddhist cultures, East meets West. Notice the Vitaraka Mudra, the, hey, hear me out. <laughs> and then the gesture of prayer, you know, greetings, hear me out, right? So that's what's going on there. Uh, back to the library cave. So now rather than the scrolls, I wanted to point out all the beautiful artwork that's both on the walls, but also in statuary. And so these caves are also famous for this beautiful interplay between 3D relief, full statues, and then this amazing painting. Um, this is, you know, just doesn't do the justice of the colors. Um, you know, a little just beautiful um, glazed uh, ceramics. Now, this is a whole beautiful uh, scene from the Lotus Sutra. The Buddha is actually doing a whole other mudra where he's got two fingers up. I'm not going to get into it. There's two Buddhas on the ceiling above him. This is a whole scene from a sutra that is being painted and represented by all of these figures. And it's a scene from a whole other play that I, I'll get into some other night. But it's also in Dunhuang that you will find, of course, our sleeping Buddha, right? Um, leaning on the side, very large image. And it's kind of common to see the sleeping Buddha done in this kind of larger than life size. So that, as you can see with our gentleman right there, these are often, you know, places of worship. And so the size kind of allows for that magnanimity of the Buddha. And now we're back. Here's our mysterious figure that I left us with in India, the Bhadrasana with the feet on the ground, right? So here, one has his feet crossed, one doesn't. But there's so many similarities between this. This is from the Ajanta Caves on the left in like the middle of India. And this on the right is from the middle of the Gobi Desert, like on our way to China. So very far apart. But I want you to notice the lion throne. You have the two lions at the base. You have the seated figure, the Buddha. You have the kind of the the halo around them with this weird kind of triangular shape, this kind of uh, inverted triangle in both of them being created. This is the future Buddha. This is not Shakyamuni. This is not the historic Buddha. This is actually images of the future Buddha, the Buddha to come. His name is Maitreya, the Buddha of friendship or friendliness. And this is, if we go back to Gandhara, this is the Afghani version of Maitreya. Now, I want you to notice right away that this looks very different than any Buddha that we've seen to date. This, this Buddha is a warrior. He wears warrior armbands. He's muscular. He's built standing. But he still comes in fearlessness, right? He still comes with that gesture of fearlessness. And in Gandhara, from where these statues, there's that Bhadrasana, uh, you know. And so I just want you to see this kind of triangular, inverted triangle that's going on with this image. But the Afghani, the Afghani imagination of what the future Buddha will look like, no, he's going to be a warrior, right? So this is that Bhadrasana, that auspicious pose. But now this is our Chinese, or at least our Central Asian version, right? And this is a, not even Central Asian, but a Chinese Maitreya. So he, in Chinese, he's called Mila Fu. Bhadrasana, both feet on the ground. And here I want to compare those. So same thing, you have the two lions, the lion throne, the lions at the base, this kind of arc of angels above them, right? Seated, both feet on the ground. Uh, the Chinese is doing the, the gesture of fearlessness and the other one doing the gesture of teaching. 
another Indian, Maitreya, future Buddha, doing the gesture of teaching. We saw this earlier. But this is where it gets interesting. This is our first glimpse into Tibetan Buddhism, and this is a Tibetan Maitreya. So again, it's like, stylistically, this looks very different. The crown, the gold, all of that is very Tibetan, but the iconography, both feet on the ground, gesture of teaching, right? So you know, oh, that's Maitreya. That's qualities of the future Buddha. In Korea, where Maitreya is Merak Basal, this is, um, you know, one foot on the ground. And this is actually an image of Maitreya before he's a full Buddha, where he's a, a scholar student. So for the Koreans, Maitreya is not a warrior. He is a great scholar, right? So this is just interesting. I just want you to notice how when we're talking about the historical Buddha, the iconography is consistent, culture to culture to culture, very similar. But it, when it comes to imaginations of the future Buddha, now the cultural, you, the uniqueness of each culture, culture starts to pop up. Oh, in Korea, he is, again, this great scholar, contemplative, right? Well, there's one last image of Maitreya that I have to show you. And it's an image that you're very familiar with, even though you may not know, you may not have known that this was Maitreya. And of course, that is our big bellied Buddha, our big bellied laughing Buddha. That's right. This is the Chinese imagination for what the future Buddha will be like. Not a great warrior, not a great scholar. No, lap of luxury. The idea, at least from the Chinese imagination, is that when Maitreya arrives, it's all gravy. It's all great. We're all going to be chilling out. That's kind of the idea of this laughing Buddha. Okay. This tradition, by the way, of the laughing Buddha, the big bellied Buddha, actually is a kind of a late development in Buddhism. You can see there, 10th century, 11th century. Even that, you know, this, this image doesn't become popular until really later on. But I just wanted you to know that if you ever see the big bellied Buddha, that's the future Buddha. If you see the skinny, emaciated skeleton Buddha, that's the past Buddha, right? Okay. Um, and so just to let you know, I mentioned the Korean Buddhism. Koreans, the Maitreya is a scholar in Korean Buddhism. Well, Buddhism enters Korea f via China, um, you know, late 5th, uh, 6th fifth, fifth, century common era. Vietnamese Buddhism is also a type of kind of Chinese-esque Buddhism. Doesn't come from Southeast Asia. Vietnamese Buddhism comes from China, from China way. And just really quickly, I need to introduce you to another Buddha, not the past Buddha, not the future Buddha. This Buddha, and a beautiful representation of this Buddha comes from uh, Longmen, the Dragon Gate in Henan, China, right? This is from, you know, 6th, 8th century. So we're pretty far from our time of the Buddha. And this is Longmen, right? This is the Dragon's Gate. Look familiar, right? The wall, the, the mountainside, punctured with caves, cave dwellings. I don't know if you can see him in the distance there, though, across the river. That is the Buddha. But wait, what Buddha is that? If we get in close, we're wondering, well, you know, long ear lobes, hair knot, Siddhartha, right? Uh, what is it? Well, this is Vairochana, the cosmic Buddha. So within Buddhism, eventually the very idea of the Buddha and Buddhahood becomes, you know, this, an, an exalted idea of Buddhahood. You, not, you can't be relegated to the past or the future, right? It's too cosmic. It's too beyond. Well, that, that Buddha that is too beyond is, is identified or known as Vairochana, the great sun Buddha. This is that Longmen, kind of a, a panorama of that you see this giant buddha surrounded by other giant beings he's 
Uh, the, unfortunately, the hands of this are also broken off, but he would have been doing a dual mudra of fearlessness and giving. Ooh, so a double whammy. The one up and the one down. So that is, now I don't want to say that's Bhairochana's mudra. So that was my whole point tonight. I didn't want you to do that. I wanted you to be like, oh, that's a Buddha. And if you could have seen the original doing the gesture of fearlessness while doing the gesture of giving. Giving fearlessness, bestowing fearlessness. Wow, what an idea, right? Well, this is uh, just to show you the delicate nature of these things. You know, I don't know if you can see the Buddha's lips up there, like the carving of the Buddha out of the mountain. This is just one tiny Buddha. And that's, you know, one way you could identify Vairochana is if he's the big giant Buddha surrounded by little Buddhas. <laughs> that's the easy way to identify the cosmic Buddha. And just to show you a kind of a better representation of that, this type of cosmic Buddha, the cosmic ideas of Buddhism, that's what heads over to Japan. 552 is sort of an official entrance date of Buddhism into Japan. This is in Nara, the old ancient capital of Japan. This is a monastery temple called Todaiji. And it was built in 752 in order to house this giant statue of Vairochana, doing the gesture of fearlessness with the gesture of giving, surrounded by a bunch of little Buddhas, right? So again, this is the cosmic idea of Buddha. And this more like transcendent divine image of the Buddha or Buddha, that's really, you know, what became very popular in China and very popular in Japan was this you know, very exalted idea of the Buddha. And on that note, I do need to mention Tibet. Tibetan Buddhism is a, is a creature unto itself. It's very hard to summarize Tibetan Buddhism, and it's even harder to summarize Tibetan art, iconography. Buddhism entered Tibet around the 7th century, so it was kind of a very late development, which is kind of why it's so complex, right? Tibet got, you know, a thousand years more than a thousand years of Buddhist development. Uh, this is Lhasa, capital of Tibet. This is Padmasambhava, the great sage that brought Buddhism to Tibet. And I just want to introduce you to one idea. And it is the idea of the Vajradhara, the Vajra holder. So just on the little, little bit I've taught you tonight, you can see, oh, lotus posture. Meditation, got it. He's got his hands at the chest. So it's a teaching, it's a communicating, delivering some information here. Yeah. But this is the Vajra holder and he's got two Vajras in his hands. This is a Vajra, if you wanna see one up close. Usually translated as a diamond, but it's not a diamond. This is the thunderbolt weapon of Indra, the god of the sky. The Vajra is a lightning bolt held. Like if you could take lightning and hold it. <laughs> Prometheus, this is a Vajra, a Dorje. And Tibetan Buddhism is like called even the Vajrayana, the way of the Vajra. It's that much about the Vajra as an implement. And I've done my best to try to avoid talking about iconography other than hands and feet and bodies. So I'm not gonna get too into this. Just show you a beautiful image. Now, this is also something we haven't seen yet. The male, female together, both with their Vajras of wisdom. So just a beautiful image to give you a, a, a slight taste of Tibetan Buddhism, which again is too complex for me to even say anything more about. After all of that, all of that, now I can introduce you to a very uh, kind of important idea in Mahayana Buddhism. That's like all kinds of East Asian, Tibetan Buddhism. And 
they, those cultures and those types of Buddhism eventually took all the ideas I just gave you, meaning like for last hour, and distilled them down to this concept of the five wisdom Buddhas, the five Tathagatas. And the first, of course, is that cosmic idea of the Buddha, the great sun Buddha in a mandala. That Buddha sits in the middle because that's the sun Buddha around which all other Buddhas revolve. This particular Buddha or this particular representation of Vairochana, he is doing the Vajra Mudra, right? This is the male and the female in unison. If you can recall the image I just showed you of the, the male and the female Buddha kissing, well, if you didn't want to represent that that male female coming together if you didn't want to represent it anthropomorphically in a kiss you could represent it in a hand gesture of the male and the female and indeed that is what virochana represents is that total unity of opposites male female light dark here everything and you can see that he virochana she it buddha has the five buddhas in the crown so it's like an ad infinitum, you know, just infinite regression where Vairochana has Vairochana in the crown of Vairochana in the crown of Vairochana. So that's just a little taste of the great sun Buddha. The other four wisdom Buddhas are the four directions. The Eastern Buddha has a blue body and is called Akshobhya, the immovable. And wouldn't you know it that the immovable, impenetrable, imperturbable Akshobhya Buddha performs the gesture of touching the earth, right? So that's what that Buddha is all about. Akshobhya, um, immovability, earth touching mudra. Amoga Siddhi, on the other hand, the green bodied, um, the Siddhis are like magical powers. And so this is Amoga Siddhi. Uh, power without vanity performs the gesture of fearlessness, right? With a begging bowl, green bodied, mentioned. Oh, and that's in the north. Ratna Sambhava, as it becomes called, the jeweled body or jewel born, golden body, performs the gesture of giving, right? Body made of gold, just giving, you know, of the seven treasures is the idea of that Buddha representing the Buddha's generosity, the Buddha's giving, the Buddha's non-attachment. That Buddha resides in the South, right? And the fifth of the wisdom Buddhas is Amitabha or Amitabha, the Buddha of infinite life or infinite light, depending on whether it's Amitabha or Amitabha. That Buddha is red-bodied, resides in the West, and performs the Dhyana Mudra. Right. So I just took you on a little quick journey around the world. And I started with these non images of the Buddha, but with these ideas of meditation, fearlessness, giving, immovable, immovability, imperturbability, right? Those are these five qualities that then in these other traditions like Tibetan, Nepalese, Chinese, and Japanese Buddhism become represented in these five unique Buddhas, right? There's a couple other that I, uh, Buddhas that I need to represent, or sorry, uh, oh, Amitabha, the red-bodied Buddha, becomes the Buddha in Japan. Like, now Vairochana is still like God, supreme, but Amida Butsu, as it's, as Buddha's called in Japanese, Amita Butsu, is, so, is not only doing the Dhyana Mudra as Amitabha does, but is doing this like super serious gesture of Dhyana Mudra, right? So if you ever see a Buddha doing that Mudra, you can say, oh, that's a serious Dhyana Mudra, probably Amitabha. But Amitabha is also often standing doing the gesture of fearlessness and the gesture of giving. So again, this is why I wanted to teach you what these gestures mean rather than what, who they are. Because you might get confused if you see this giant Vairochana and he's doing this gesture and say, that's Amitabha. No, but a standing Buddha doing this, um, Amitabutsu. 
And of course, this image of the standing Buddha, who is an emissary, an ambassador, giving or bestowing fearlessness. Well, this Buddha, this Butsu in Japan, again, giving the fearlessness is this Buddha, the, the Buddha, a savior Buddha that can come pick you off your deathbed and take you to the promised land. That is sort of the significance, or at least in Japan, or the import of that standing figure bestowing fearlessness is this person or this entity or this energy that comes on one's deathbed, right? And that healing energy of the Buddha can also be represented in a Buddha called Baishajya. That's kind of a mysterious figure that I just needed to throw in there. Blued body. And so you might say, Michael, but you said that Akshobhya was blue bodied. Yeah, I know. This Buddha, Baishajya, which means healing, is like lapis blue, lapis lazuli. Akshobhya tends to be a little more sapphire if you want to get like technical. But really the difference here is that this blue bodied Buddha is performing the gesture of giving. Not the gesture of immovable, you know, earth touching like Akshobhya. This is a blue bodied that is giving. And if I showed you oh, also with a wish fulfilling gem in his lap, granting wishes it's also sometimes a begging bowl but this statue helps you see that this giving also has an herb has a plant coming out of the palm and that's because Baishaja is this buddha of healing herbs this buddha of medicinal herbs this buddha of medicine and this is a mandala you know in, in a of Baishaja's buddha land of all the healing herbs with the blue bodied, the lapis blue bodied Buddha in the middle, performing that gesture of giving, right? And on that note, just to wrap this up, this would not be a complete talk on the Buddha, Buddha iconography, if I didn't talk about the female, the feminine. Now this is tricky because I've sort of, as I said, I've limited this talk to the history of the representation of the Buddha, which historically tends to be male or tends to be in the forms that I just showed you. And so I want to just, you know, I'm a historian in that note. So I'm just here to tell you, this is where the, the iconography of the Buddha went. It went to here, went to there, went to here. But all the while, all the, this whole presentation actually, Lurking in the background has been this figure, originally referred to as Padma Pani, the lotus holder or lotus bearer. And so right away when I show you this image, having gone on the journey that we've been on together, I, I hope that you can read this image. Lotus posture, meditation, got it. Gesture of giving though. Oh, so bestower, giving, and then holding this lotus flower and this sort of feminine image. Want to show you the same figure, Padmapani, but now the standing image, gesture of giving, bearing the lotus in the left hand, right? Well, this figure of Padmapani, the lotus holder, eventually becomes this figure. This figure is called Avilokiteshvara, the Bodhisattva of Compassion. Uh, uh, Ishvara means Lord. Avilokita means like to see the world. So the Lord that watches over the world. Right away, you should be like, whoa, what kind of seated posture is that? I've seen full lotus. I've seen standing. I've even seen Bhadrasana seated with the feet on the ground. What is this one knee up, what, you know, one foot on the ground? Well, this is the Bodhisattva pose, the Rajasana, the royal pose, or sometimes called the Rajalila Asana, the royal ease pose. So this Bodhisattva, this figure, Avilokiteshvara, definitely deserves her own night, her own presentation. But really quickly, I want you to notice 
a little figure in the crown. Uh, well, I'll have another one, but that's actually Amitabha Buddha, a seated Buddha doing a Dhyana Mudra. Oh, that's Amitabha. And Avilokiteshvara, the Bodhisattva of compassion here, always has the one Amitabha in the crown. This is again the royal ease pose, right? Very interesting pose, very, well, very complex, right? Whoa, even, it's like, whoa, easy, easy, right? Just so, so much more dynamic, so much more significant in a way, right? Uh, this Avilokiteshvara in China becomes the Chinese way of saying Avilokiteshvara is Guanyin, Guan Shi Yin, hearer of the world's crying. Uh, so this is kind of a, a Chinese looking Guan Yin or Avilokiteshvara, also with the Amitabha in the crown, lotus posture. There's that Amitabha seated in Dhyana in the crown in a, the female figure. In Japanese, this bodhisattva is called Kanon. That is the Japanese pronunciation of Guanyin, Kanon. You see the Buddha in the crown, but you also see the baby. It's like, baby? Where is the baby coming from? Well, in Japanese Buddhism, Kanon definitely becomes kind of a savior goddess, a fertility goddess. If a woman wants to get pregnant and she's having trouble, can definitely go to the Bodhisattva of Compassion here. In Tibetan Buddhism, Avilokiteshvara, Guanyin, Kanon, is known as Chenrezig, right? Always identifiable, identifiable by the four arms. Namaskara in the middle. Lotus, because remember, this being started off as the lotus bearer, the Padmapani. So you get the lotus flower in the left hand and then the rosary in the right for counting mantras. This is a kind of a offshoot of Chen Rizig, an offshoot of Avilokiteshvara. Too much to go into. You see the Amitabha, but this is a, a being, a bodhisattva called Tara. There's white Taras, green Taras. But the most important part I can mention about this figure is I just want you to say, I'm going to go back one. Just notice the body posture from this perfectly upright to this just notice that slight right how different that is so tara is this kind of you know just a different figure for that dynamic pose whether it's a white tara or a green tara avilokiteshvara becomes associated with the 11 uh, or the Bhumi stages, the 10 Bhumi stages, and you will see an 11-headed Avilokiteshvara. Here's another 11-headed Avilokiteshvara, but with the Amitabha. And the reason why I'm concluding this presentation with this Buddha, Bodhisattva, it's a lot of people argue whether it, it you know, is it a Bodhisattva, is it a Buddha? Well, the reason why I want to conclude this presentation with this figure is this figure of Kanon, the Japanese, this Bodhisattva of compassion, eventually the full fruition of this being is the 11 headed thousand armed Bodhisattva of compassion, right? And the reason why I'm concluding with this image and with this Buddha, with this Bodhisattva, is to just, you know, get you to think about, you know, if, if this gesture, the fearlessness, you know, if, if it had that much meaning, and this has that much meaning, and this has that much meaning, and if it's a Vajra in one hand, that means this. What this image is, is all of it. <laughs> every possible mudra, every possible implement, every possible posture, every possible pose. In fact, the thousand-armed, eleven-headed Avilokiteshvara that I'm showing you here is in a giant hall in Japan with a thousand standing, eleven-headed, thousand-armed, eleven, -headed, thousand -armed 11 uh, <laughs> Avilokiteshvaras.
And so now you literally have the seated posture, the standing posture, and every conceivable manifestation in between. And indeed, that is what Avilokiteshvara, the Bodhisattva of Compassion, represents. Upaya. All the skillful means, all the iconography. And so there really is a way that you could just study the thousand-armed, eleven-headed encyclopedia, and you would learn all the mudras, all the iconography, and all the imagery. And so again, this is just, if you're curious, this full-blown vision of the Buddha, of Kanon Avilokiteshvara can be found in Kyoto. It's in Japan. That's the Sanju Sanjendo, the hall of a thousand and one thousand-armed bodhisattvas. And with that, I will call it a night. Thank you all so much for your patient attention. I am going to switch over to a different mode to try to see everybody. Katie's got her hand up or something is going on. I was clapping. Oh, that was a clap. Yay. Thank you. Let's see. I'm going to share your screen. I'm going to how to stop sharing the screen. There's everybody. All right. Um, great. So we have some time. Questions, answers, ideas, comments. What, what was that book that you just flashed up that looked really cool? So this is, do, do, do. it's not impossible to find. It is, if you can see that. I'm going to, hang on a second. I'm going to make yep. it bigger. Okay. And what this is, is an amazing, um, if I can find you a sample page here. Oh, it's an encyclopedia of that image. And well, basically it's, a, a, the uh, pages aren't super great, but it's an encyclopedia of every single hand <laughs> and what's in every hand. Because if you were to sit down, if you were like a crafts person and you were gonna make one of these, there is a specific <laughs> thing that is in each of the thousand hands. <laughs> and the encyclopedia that I just showed you that it is not just what is in each hand, it's an encyclopedia of the meaning and significance of what is in each hand, why it's in that hand, why it's across from that hand, and, you know, the whole big meaning. So. Wow. Cool. Thanks. <laughs> My pleasure. <laughs> Eric just said it's $1,000 on Amazon, and Katie said a dollar per hand. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I, that's a, I got... You know, that stuff's tricky, though. Keep looking. I don't want you to think that these books are actually that expensive. It's just sometimes when they pop up, they're expensive. I got mine for not that much. So don't be dissuaded if you're curious. We're unmuted. Hey, I got a question. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much for this awesome presentation. Um, thank you. Fascinating and, and great stuff. So in my experience with both uh, Tibetan Vajrayana and um, Japanese Mahayana, they have a lot more entities than this right they have all these celestial bodhisattvas like going through monasteries in japan it's like i have no idea who this is or that is but i mean is it safe to say if you're in a in the monastery in um in uh thailand burma uh cambodia if there's a figure it's probably the buddha or do they have this whole panoply as well great great question i totally kind of missed that in my southeast asian uh portion you know, the type of Buddhism practiced in Southeast Asia, this kind of Theravadan style, part of the Buddhology, if you will, it's not theology, right? It's Buddhology, but part of the Buddhology of that type of Buddhism is that there, there's only one Buddha per world, you know, not even per eon. You know, these, these Buddhas come around only very seldom. And so, sh yes, to answer your question, when you're down in those parts of, of Southeast Asia and in those Theravadan communities, 
I would, you know, 9.9999% out of 10 times, it's only Siddhartha Shakyamuni. There are, because Maitreya, the future Buddha, is a part of the Theravada tradition, it's not just a Mahayana thing, you might find a Maitreya. You might find a Maitreya in Southeast Asia. I'm not saying you won't. And because it's the 21st century, anything goes, and you may find an Avilokiteshvara Bodhisattva of compassion in a Theravada temple. And the scholar, you know, nerd historian, graduate student way back in the day is going to be like, what are you, what are you, how did that happen? But the reality is, is that this stuff, you know, in the 21st century has cross pollinated so much. But definitely an answer to your question, yeah. And that's part of that idea of the bare right shoulder. I didn't note, actually, in all of the images I showed you of the five wisdom Buddhas, they all had both shoulders covered, interestingly. So, you know, just little things. Uh, a follow-up, actually, to part of your question. <laughs> I'm, you know, I'm sneaky. I, I'm trying to be sneaky, and what I mean by that is, is that this is a very gentle presentation to trick you into thinking it's much easier than it really is. Right. Yeah, there's so many, you know, Dakinis, Bodhisattvas, Yakshas, Gandharavas, Asuras, Maharagas, and it goes on and on and on. And to really know and study all that iconography, yeah, I mean, it would, it would take hours and hours and hours and all of no, that. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. The, uh... The relative simplicity, you know, relative, um, it's helpful to just get the broad outlines and the rules that sometimes get broken. Just as an aside, I, I don't know if this is relevant. You know, my experience with rural Thailand is, you know, they are really into the Buddha. And it's funny when people say Buddhist, Buddhism is atheistic because my experience among, you know, rural Thais is it's, it's kind of monotheistic. They don't think of the Buddha as this Jude that got enlightened. You know, I don't know what the monks think, but they definitely treat it as like God that you pray to and get boons from, and it's the guy. And um, yeah, that was my experience of them. And yeah, it was pretty singular, as you say. But you know, it was also my, it was interesting for me to be in Bodh Gaya and see the, the uh, it doesn't just happen in the West, just the interplay of the different strands of Buddhism learning from each other. Mm. You, know, you definitely get that in America. You get like, you know, Tibetan Buddhists doing their retreat, doing the Japanese eating style, or sitting on Japanese zafus, or, you know, at Spirit Rock. They have, you know, Zen stuff, Tibetan stuff. So definitely in the West, the all three line, major lineages interplay. But seeing that in Asia was interesting too. And as you say, history is dynamic. You know, it's they have television, they have the internet. So <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> it's interesting, you know, I, I, I'd be curious, you know, to be in your position and go and do an art study, you know, how is the, the imagery of other strands of Buddhism in the age of interconnection, Ooh. you know, playing out into these other into these other um lineages that'd be an interesting question to examine indeed and you might have even picked up when i showed you the standing avilokiteshvara with the baby it starts to look a little like the Mar mary mother with the baby jesus and indeed you will find in china and japan images of what is definitely mary <laughs> But uh -huh. it's definitely Avi <laughs> Isn't isn't like some of the Amida Butsu cult in J Japan like the thing Tina Turner prays to? Isn't that what? kind of like Christian in some ways? Like there's mm. this thing that's going to come, and if I pray, I'll go to heaven, and like that. Yeah. Anyway, you're the expert. I, I'm talking <laughs> a lot. I, I appreciate it. Great presentation. Yep. Learned a lot. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions, comments, or any? We got a few minutes. Michael, it's Noam. Hi, Noam. Um, speaking of Christianity, I, if I recall you saying at one point something, you didn't talk at all today about halos. <laughs> mm. And, uh, and I, I, I think I remember you saying once that, that there's some evidence that the halo kind of came from either Buddhist or pre-Buddhist iconography and then migrated to Christianity. I may be misremembering, but one thing that, that jumped out at me today was the Nagas were very halo-like. You know, it, but all, most of the other images where there was a halo, it was an abstract circle. It was just this circle behind the head, whatever the heck that means, which I'd love to hear what it means. But then the Naga was like, oh, that's, that's like 
There are snakes <laughs> behind that, that Buddha and, and that forms a halo-like thing, but it actually has substance to it. It's not an abstract circle. Hmm. Yeah, indeed. You know, and that is an interesting um, replacement of the tree, of the Bodhi tree, the serpent, right? So interesting, that idea. As far as halos go, yeah, it's another way, it's another aspect in which this presentation is just really just scratching the surface because keeping it just to basically five, five mudras and sitting, standing, walking, lying down kind of a thing. Um, I didn't get to really get into what are the colors significant? What are the body colors? What is the significance of the halo? You know, and, and I didn't even, you know, get to touch on bigger ideas about which came first, you know, Buddhism or Christianity when it comes to like the rosary, when it comes to things like the halo, right? There's a lot of, a lot of really good graduate students out there that are doing the hard work on kind of who's, who took from who, who borrowed from who, which came first and all of that. Yeah, the only, you know, you know, the, the, the halos in Buddhism, of course, they'll either center from out of here, out of here, or out of the heart type of a thing. And so where the halos emanating from is, you know, giving the image some power, giving it some significance in that way. Any, you know, any art historian student worth their salt, you know, knows that in a lot of like, renaissance art or even buddhist art a lot of times the halo is to point out the significant person <laughs> like if you have a group of 10 or, or sorry a group of 13 let's say you have a group of 13 guys and one guy's got the halo it's like oh that must be jesus right that must be the most important guy in the room so yeah i didn't get to talk about all of the other beautiful wonderfulnesses but nor did I get to talk about the rainbow body, rainbow auras and all that. So thanks, Dom. Any other questions, comments, ideas? I just wanted to say that was amazing. Oh, thank you, Tania. Good to see you. It's good to see you too. That was like mind blowing. <laughs> you did it again. Yay. Yeah. You are a wealth of information. Yes, exactly. No, I'm like, wow. Um, friends, I just want to say I have, I'm, I'm not looking at the chat. And so if you've written any questions in the chat or anything, I, I'm not, probably will not see them. So you can ask them out loud now. Um, just want to point out that. I noticed something in the, um, one of the female bodhisattvas had a stigmata in her hands. Hmm. Um, often it's another thing too. Every you guys have really good eyes. Um, and speaking of eyes, <laughs> the stigmata you speak of are usually eyes. <laughs> um, you know, this is just sort of a, an interesting thing. That again, it, it's a, a presentation unto itself, which is what is the significance of having an eye on the palms? They ha I'll have the eye on the palms of the feet, an eye in the middle, right? A kind of third eye. Well, eyes, of course, in, in religious iconography are always indicative of wisdom. Or I mean, say always. I don't want to say these things. I hope you all know that when I say always, it don't, doesn't mean every single time. But the idea is, is that the eyes represent wisdom. And so you get third eye wisdom. You get it kind of like a skill and means, skillful means, wisdom with the hands. There's a lot to that. Um, yeah, again, it's it's a... Another thing I didn't have, I didn't have more time to talk about, um, but yeah, it's not a stigmata. <laughs> I think you might have said it, people didn't know what it meant, but you know, that imagery of underneath the dying Buddha of the monk with his back to us yep. and the little tripod thing, is there any speculation about what that means? Oh yeah, I, I was struggling um, I was struggling to actually not make a big deal about it at the moment. So I, I was like, I can't find the words, so forget it. <laughs> but what the significance of that is, is, is that that seems to be this sort of the beggar, the wanderer. And that does seem to be this sort of way of keeping your stuff off the ground, <laughs> basically. <laughs> like if you were making a camp. So the idea was, is that 
that person is camped out <laughs> in front of the dying Buddha. <laughs> Or it's or that's one way to read it. They're camped out. <laughs> All right, folks, if there's nothing more, that's the time. I'm going to call it a night. I, I want to just thank you all so much for coming and watching and being here. Appreciate your attention. I really wish we could all, of course, be here in presence. But uh, it's great to see you all nonetheless. Thank you. Thank you so much. Great class. Thank you so much, much Michael. It. That was awesome. Thanks. Katie, I'm yeah. going to pass it to you for any. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not sure I've ever said, huh, out loud in my apartment before as much <laughs> as I just did. And oh, <laughs> so thank you very much. Um, and I'm going to put some links uh, in the chat where you are invited to practice Donna for the collective if you would like. Um, so the collective is entirely run by volunteers and the community is created and sustained um, from Donna. So if you are able to, um, you can channel your inner Ratnasambhava and make the giving mudra um, by practicing dana for the collective. Um, and if you aren't in a place right now where you can practice dana, your very presence creates the community. So we are 100% committed to never putting a financial barrier between people and the Dharma. And the uh, very act of gathering together in Sangha to listen to the teachings is already uh, building community and it's already coming from a place that is like very powerful and very sacred. Um, and now more than ever, community is really important. Um, so give if you can, don't if you can't, and come back either way. So on Sunday, um, Michael will be back and we'll be, um, I hear there's going to be a slow fade on the Vimalakirti beat. So we're going to be kind of recovering from our, or integrating our Vimalakirti experience and uh, turning the corner on the next thing. So looking forward to seeing everyone here on Sunday. Thank you again, Michael. This was just incredible. I, I feel like I could feel new connections being made in my mind and I'm just so grateful. Thank you very much. Thank you, Katie. Thanks, everybody. Have a great night. All right. Thank you. Have a good one, everybody. Thanks again. Bye.